Let's pray. Father, Lord, as we gather together in person and from home, Lord, may your spirit be with us, for you're not limited by physical presence. And may you draw our hearts heavenwards to remind us that as a family, Lord, we're to come together to remind ourselves of the Creator Father. In Jesus' name I pray. Scripture reading this morning comes to us from the book of Philippians, chapter 2, verses 3 and 4. I'm reading from the New King James. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. May God bless the reading of his word.
Good morning and happy Sabbath. It's been a long time since I have preached in Bellas here. I think the last time I was here was before COVID. And that's almost two years and that's crazy. It's ridiculous, isn't it? I hope that very soon uh, the pulpits at church will be filled with more of you as we move forward in these crazy times to remember who we are and what we are doing here in Singapore. And I know that Balestra is going to go ahead with the vaccinated and unvaccinated uh, services. And I know some of you, upon hearing that, will have some thoughts in your mind. And I'd like to share a little bit of my journey through this whole thing. Uh, also deciding what we're going to do in SDAC. Well, the verse for today is from Philippians 2, verse 3 and 4. And I share this verse with you not because it's something that I am... I've already achieved something I've already done, but it's something that had constantly challenged me as I meditate upon it for the last month. It is very difficult. It is very hard. And I would like to read it again. If you have your Bibles, it's easy to be lazy when you're watching the stream, to just depend on the screen. But do take out the Bible, dust off the dust from it, Turn to the verse, and I would like you to read it with me in Philippians chapter 2, verse 3 to 4. P234. It says, Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant, or in some translation, more valuable, and other translations as higher than yourselves. And let, let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. It's easy to, in the midst of all this fear and, and craziness and chaos, to, to want to protect yourself. That's instinct, that's nature, and that's normal. And so do not beat yourself up or feel guilt-tripped by anybody that you're trying to protect yourself. But again, we are not just humans, but we are followers of Christ. And Jesus challenges us as Christians to, to go beyond. And he sets for us this challenge that do nothing from selfish ambition. And I look at James and like, I, I can't do that. I'm selfish many times, very often. And he says, put others above you in humility. How? Well, I like to share my thoughts. I haven't come to a final conclusion on that yet. But anyway, let me bring you to the Pyramid of Giza. Right? From young you grow up, you hear about the Pyramid of Giza and you're like this mysterious triangular dome shape inside. And it's this amazing kind of a structure that you grow up and go, wow. And if you've never been there, you think it's this, this really ancient structure is found in this really far away place near Egypt in the desert, in the wilderness, and it's just like, one day I want to go there and visit. But just to, 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 to share with you, if you ever go to Egypt, be prepared to be a little bit disappointed. Because if you look at it from this photo that I'm showing you, yeah, it's right. It's just, it looks like it's just in the middle of nothing, in the middle of nowhere, and it's just this really awesome structure where you're going to find some treasures inside. But then if you look at it from the city's perspective, that's where the Pyramid of Giza is. Is my mic off? That's where the Pyramid of Giza is, and it's just right there a few kilometers from civilization just right there and you can actually walk to the period of Giza from McDonald's kind of change the perspective of the whole place hey I'll give you another view I'll, I'll, I'll turn it 180 and it's gonna view this is the view from the pyramid look at how close the city is perspective you know, a photo can be very, very misleading and it gives you a, a warped perspective of reality that can only be changed if you're there in person or you widen what you're looking at. 
What's happening today due to the pandemic is we're restricted and yet exposed at the same time to information in a very interesting way. I lived, as some of you, at a time where there was no internet. And then I went into higher education just as internet was beginning to blossom and boom. I was the second generation of IT students in Singapore. And, and you go there, you discover this awesome world of internet. And mind you, when I first surfed the net, it was a blue screen with white text. You don't know exactly the command to type in or you won't find what you're looking for. And if you ever find a photo, you found gold mine. Compared to the internet today, of course, everything is online, it's so easily accessible from your phone, photos, videos, graphics, text. But then there's also this thing called artificial intelligence. And what it does, if you don't understand, is you start feeding you information that you're interested in and giving you this echo chamber where you just read up on stuff and you hear stuff that you're interested in, but you'll not be exposed to a different perspective unless you intentionally seek them out. Looking at the, at the Pyramid of Giza from another direction. The recent news has been flooded with what's happening in Afghanistan. And Afghanistan, this place, is, is easy for us to think. The Taliban, and you think of the terrorists, and you think of this, again, this really war-torn zone of people who are just like in this crazy chaos. And you just label these people as a certain group of people, forgetting that that's also Afghanistan that they are just human beings. They're just the same as you and me. They like balloons, they get married, and they live life with a smile on their face. Because what we see on television, the, the, the rhetoric that we hear is just pumping us with a certain information, and then we just go online, we seek out the same kind of information, and then that's all we are exposed to, and it alters our mind to think of certain people, certain places in a certain way. Let me share my personal story. This is Monash University Engineering and IT Building. I never got to go inside because while I was there, they were building the building. It was like this awesome construction, this wonderful building. I never got to go sit inside at all. But anyway, on, um, this building was built in a place where I, I didn't have a washing machine in my house when I first went to Melbourne to study. So I have to walk to a friend's place uh, every couple of days with a whole basket of uh, laundry to do laundry at their house. They were really nice to let us do that. And so we'll walk across the campus because I live on one side of campus and they live on the other side. And so that's the Monash University. I walk past it every day and I'll, I'll see that building being built. So the story is not about the building, but about my experience there. When I first went there, it was very interesting because I didn't enroll in a, a typical Singaporean Asian course. Most of the Singaporeans would be in the IT, the engineering, the law, the business, the accounting. So I enrolled in a course called the Bachelor of Multimedia and Business. Short acronym, BOM. And so one of the things is, if you go to the multimedia class, you go to the business class, well, there's a lot of Asians, some Malaysians, Hong Kong people, a few Singaporeans, but if you go to the multimedia class, I'm the only international student in the entire lecture hall. Because nobody, no Asian, Singaporean, their right mind will allow their son to study multimedia at that point because there's no future. Yeah, right. Look at the world today. But anyway, I was in the class. I was, of course, obviously the only international student dude. Um, didn't have their accent, didn't have their hair, didn't have their eyes. Looked look totally different in another part of uh, another campus. And then I made a good, uh, uh, my good friend, uh, who's now my good friend. I met a friend whose name is Stephen McGuire. And he's Aussie, Aussie, Aussie. He's like third generation Australian. His father is a, a race car driver in a supercar series. He has a really thick accent. So for one week, I didn't understand him. I like, man, I grew up in an English speaking country. And I, I, at that point, I like, I really like, oh man, is my English that bad? And I realized that your years actually takes time to tune like musical notes. 
When you go to a new accent, your ear needs to get used to it. And so after one week of just smiling and nodding and not knowing what's going on, I start to understand my friend, Stephen McGuire. And, and then the first dinner we had after class was this. I said, James, um, you're Singaporean. i like, yes. And he's like, but you're not, not like a Singaporean. I'm like, what do you mean? And he's like, you're having dinner with me. I'm like, huh? What do you mean? He said, you see, the Singaporeans in Monash are very exclusive. They only like sit with Singaporeans, they'll eat with Singaporeans, they'll, they'll play with Singaporeans, and anybody that's not Singaporean, they don't let us in. Said, really? Let me go investigate. So I went and I, I joined uh, the, the Monash University Singaporean Club. Lo and behold, there was like 15 Singaporeans from different courses. Of course, nobody studied multimedia. And they're like, James, why do you study multimedia? So stupid. And then I, we, and it was true. For three months, I was a part of the club. Um, we sit together and we speak Singlish, enjoyed it. And then we ate Singaporean food that we all tried to cook by calling our mothers. Hey, Ma, how do you cook that one? And then we try to cook it and we force everybody to be our guinea pigs. And then we'll go shopping together, we go on road trip together, we study together or we pretend to study together. And then we hang out and we play over the weekend together. And then, and then after three months, it dawned upon me, oh wow, it is true. I've not met a local Aussie at all for three months. So this reverse you know, discrimination and, you know, we don't hang out with anybody else. And then so it came to a point where, man, I haven't really hang out with uh, Stephen Maguire for three months. Uh, he understand because I told you I was going on this little investigation. I decided to drop out of the club. And what happened was I started to label those guys. And these Singaporeans are awful. Like you fly all the way to Australia and you're all the way here for two to three years and you don't even spend any time getting to know the local culture. All you do is complain that the shop closed at four o'clock. All you do is complain that Sunday there's nowhere to eat, there's no shopping centers to go, everything in Singapore is better, Australia is horrible. That's all I hear all day. And so I started to like, oh, I don't like the Singaporean clubs. I don't like the Singaporeans. And for the next one and a half years, I didn't hang out with any Singaporeans, except for those in church. It took a little while. It took a few years later to realize that as much as I dislike them labeling the non-Singaporeans and discriminating against them in a certain way, when I left the club, I did the exact same thing, but just from the other side. I labeled the Singaporeans in a certain way. And you know what we both did? We dehumanized one another. You know, when we restrict people to a category, to a label, to a certain stereotype, we objectify them and we see them as less than humans. One of my bad habits, one of my greatest struggle in life is not to be judgmental when I drive. In Singapore, when you drive, there are certain groups of drivers that forget that there is a, a light in their car called a signal. You just need to lightly touch the stick at the side that comes as a part of the car that you buy, no extra charges. You pull it down, the right yellow amber light lights up, and in your car, there's a green arrow that tells you it's on. You don't even have to push it back up for most cars. As you turn, as you straighten your car, the thing will pop back into place. One step process. But then in Singapore, there's some people who love their car so much, you see, I'm very judgmental right now. They love their cars so much, they don't dare to touch the stick for fear of wear and tear. And so they will change lanes with such excellent race car driving skills into your lane. See, judgment time. <laughs> And one of the roads that I take when I go to ASDAQ is Brattle Road. And I come, and whenever, 
Whenever I exit, I have to go past various feeder lane, the smaller roads. That if you ever take your basic driving test, it's very clear that the main road has priority. The feeding lane have to wait before you pass and come out. But some people, they come out two things. They don't signal and they don't check their blind spots. So one day as I was driving one of these cars and I was already, my front of my car was already half in front of his car. He squeezed in front of my car. Never mind if you speed off, right? I would just forget it. He squeezed in front of my car. I jammed my brake and then he slowed down. I was really upset, trying to remain a human being, trying to remain a pastor. Okay, so my goal was to I'll drive beside him to take a look at who this individual is. Not to intimidate, not to say, no, I just wanted to see his face. And I drove, I sped up, I looked, Lo and behold, he was my friend. Oh! <laughs> Immediately, the, the crazy thing is, although I was still not very happy, I laughed. I went from super angry, having non-pastoral thoughts, to like laughing and go, idiot. And of course, I got to church. He went on his way. The moment I parked my car, I called him and I, bro. And of course, he went, Paisea, sorry, ah. Eh? But the thing is that the very thing that happened was straight away, as soon as I saw his face, as soon as I don't see him as a no face driver, as soon as I place a name upon the person, my anger disappeared. I think there's a lot of times where we will categorize or objectify people we disagree with, but we forget that they are human beings. Try next time. The moment you're going to get upset with something or some group of people, think of one person with a name in that group. I tell you, your anger will drop immediately. Of course, somebody you like, that will be very helpful. We are in a society that has constantly been taught to just objectify people. Instagram handles, hashtags, TikTok videos. Oh, this person is very famous. YouTube, text, blog, all these things is so easy. WhatsApp, messages, oh, that's the worst. You just have a bunch of texts and then you just argue over the text and you don't see the face, try video chatting that person, I'll tell you it'll be better. Start putting a face or a name to something that is of the opposing side and I tell you, you will be more willing and open to communication. So today, I'd like to share with you a very classic idiom. Uh, it was, I always thought it was the entire poem, but apparently it was a idiom, it was inspired by the actual poem, which is much longer, and it says, 煮豆燃豆吉, Let me translate. It says that the, to cook the beans, you're cooking the beans with its bean stock, and because of that, the bean is crying in the pot, asking, we are from the same root, why are we causing each other pain? It's a story from Cao Zi, who is the brother of Cao Pi, and both of them are the sons of Cao Cao, if you heard of the Romance of Three Kingdoms. And so when Cao Cao passed away, he passed the, the, the emperor's position. Of course, Cao, Cao, Cao Pi became the emperor of the Wei, Wei Guo at that time, and he had to eliminate all the threat. And one of his threat was his very talented poet, his brother Cao Zi. And so he, because of that, he locked him out in a, in a dungeon, and he asked him one day as he was visiting the dungeon, he says, if you cannot come out with a poem, within seven steps, I'm going to chop off your head. And so within four steps, Cao Zi shared the poem, which is much longer than this, which inspired this idiom, to talk about how as brothers, as families, why are we persecuting one another? 
It's so easy in this very diversified, divided world to forget that we are all children, first and of, of all, of Adam and Eve, then of Noah, and then of Christ, God the Father. That we forget even the non believers are our brothers and sisters in Christ. The person you read in the news who do stupid things, those people, those images, are your brothers and sisters in Christ. It's so easy when you read the news in the morning. I used to read it every morning, and I'll read through the news. And now, you know what I did? Actually, I stopped that habit because I think I should give God priority before I read the news. Because if, before that, I'll, I'll read the news and then I'll read my Bible. I realized that when I was reading the news, I was just being in this super judgmental spirit. I would judge people. Oh, stupid. Hey, why are you doing that? Why is he doing this? Why is he doing that? I would just be a whole hour of judging because I don't know them. Just names, silly folks. And the fact is, news are news only because they're sensational. And nowadays, the sad reality is violence has become such a normal thing that even though we see the wars on our TV, in our news, we don't flinch. I remember 20 years ago, when I see news report of just a glimpse of war, I'll be like, oh, that's horrible. Today, I expect it to come. When's the next news report of some death? When's the next report of some war? It's only until that happens that I think that's news. We have been desensitized to all those violent acts against our brothers and sisters that we have dehumanized everybody, objectified them, that all we see are just things. But I have four passages that I'd like to share with you this morning, this afternoon, and I'd like you to consider what God is saying to you through these four passages. I will not speak too much because I think this has to be a personal, deep conviction from the Spirit into your hearts. God has convicted me of certain things as I read through these four passages, and I'm sure God will speak to you this morning. Turn with me to Romans 11. Do you see I don't put the whole passage up there? Intentionally. Romans 11, verse 17 to 18. The first passage I'm going to share with you is what Paul wrote to the general church, especially the church he planted among the Gentiles. Romans 11, 17 to 18 say, But if some of the branches were broken off, talking about the Jews, and you, although a wild olive shoot, were grafted in among the others, and now share in the nourishing roots of the olive tree, do not be arrogant toward the branches. If you are, remember it is not you who support the root, but the root that supports you. So the very first thing that we need to realize that we are all a part of that, we are the wild olive branches. What are the people that I think as Christians or Seventh-day Adventists that we really judge are the Jews? We always look at them and go, you guys missed the Messiah. You guys neglected the Messiah. You guys crucified the Messiah. Not forgetting they were the OG, original. We were grafted in. To not judge them because their failure is something that we can fall into just as quickly. In fact, I think we have been. But through the grace of God, He's redeeming the Jews and redeeming us, the Gentiles. But the key idea in this phrase, I will not speak too much more after this, is the root that we are sustained from the same root. Your enemy those who disagree with you, those who are sinners, which I think is actually all of us, those who are not in the church, those who do not have the same theological standing as you, understanding as you, they are your brothers and sisters in Christ under God the Father. And it's not for you to decide who get grafted in, who get taken out. It is God's work, so stop being God. We must rehumanize 
rehab our view of one another. Second passage, Second Corinthians, six eighteen. Second Corinthians chapter six, verse eighteen reads. From Paul again to the Corinth church, mind you, the Corinth church was a church in chaos, conflict. Paul writes to them, reminding them of this. And I will be a father to you of God, and you shall be my sons and daughters to me, says the Lord Almighty. In the midst of conflict, if there's anything messed up about a church, the Corinth church was guilty. If there's any church that was in as much conflict as we can imagine, it's the church of Corinth. If there's any church that hates each other within a church, it's the church of Corinth. And Paul's approach is to say, remember, God is the father of you and your enemy. You are all sons and daughters of God. Lord Almighty. Next verse, turn me to Matthew chapter 7, verse 1 to 3. Matthew 7, verse 1 to 3. I don't know how we always miss this verse. It's very clear. It's in one of the longest sermon in the Bible, preached by none other than Jesus himself. He preached for a few chapters. Imagine if I did that in church. And this is in the middle of the sermon. Chapter 7, verse 1 to 3, he says, Judge not. Is that clear? I think it's very clear. That you be not judged. For with the judgment you pronounced, you will be judged. And with the measure you use it, it will be measured to you. Why do you seek the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not see the law that is in your own? There's so many things I can unpack from these three verses. But just imagine the imagery of that. Jesus is being slightly humorous. You know, when you read the Bible with our modern eyes, it's very easy to read it very stoically. But as I hear from my Jewish professor, Jacques Dukan, that we miss a lot of the Jewish humor. The humor is a little sarcastic, maybe like the, the British. But they are very funny people. But that we don't catch it because it's translated into English. We miss it. But just the visual of this. Imagine this guy with this log in his eye trying to take out a speck from his eyes and as he moves, the log hit his friend's head. And then hit his friend's head. You know, it's just so funny. But it's so true. The problem when we don't deal with our own sins, with our own problems, when we try to help others, the problem is we cause more hurt to them than help them. Yeah, we take out the speck eventually, maybe, but their head is like superbly, violently bruised that they're in a concussion. So God says, don't do it. Because what you do to others, others do to you, and then you, two of you with a log in your eyes start hitting each other, everybody gets hurt in, this, in the church. Then you say, Pastor, then do we have no standards? Here. Let God speak to that person. Don't try to be the mouthpiece of God all the time. Even as a pastor, I try, I refrain from trying to tell people what to do. I just share with you what I see in the scripture, but I let God speak. If you think somebody's doing something wrong, here's a good practice. You pray for that person for 10 days, daily, for an hour each day before you speak to that person. Try that and see how that works out. I'm, I promise you, you make you and that person a much better Christian. So before you've done that, before you've prayed for the individual that you want to speak to, to, to correct, to, to help, pray for that person for 10 days, an hour each, 10 hours, then go speak. I'm sure 
you experience miraculous transformation not only in that person but in yourself. Judge not that you will not be judged because at the end of the day, God is our judge. Let God be God. And finally, back to the scripture reading that I started off today's sharing. Philippians chapter 2, verse 3 to 4. Then can we come back to this verse after listening to God speak through the previous three passages. Then this verse, these three verses, looks, two verses, looks more possible. Philippians 2, 3 and 4 says, Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also the interests of others. In the current discussion of everything that's going on around us, right now face the discussion of the vaccination, vaccinated service, non-vaccinated service, whatever that is, do you consider the person on the other side more significant, more valuable to you than yourself? Do you put his or her interests above your own? A moment of confession. I don't. I can't. That's why every day I pray, God help me to do it. And when it does happen occasionally, immediately I'm recogni I recognize that I've been humbled by God because that act was not James. It was God's Spirit working through me. Because the nature, the, the real James, don't want to do that. It's against my human nature. All I want is to objectify, dehumanize the other person and look down on the other person and think that I'm better than that person. But God reminds me I'm not. God reminds me I'm the same. God reminds me that my fellow person that I'm judging is a human. That I need to rehumanize my view of everybody around me, even as much as I dislike their opinions, their views, their stand, and what their actions are. There's a few practical sharing from this person, this couple that lives in New Zealand. One person is from Malaysia, moved to New Zealand. The other person is uh, a mix of Taiwanese and uh, uh, Malaysian descent. And one, so this is something that they wrote in their blog and um, I know them myself and I think it's really good. Just gotta share. Nine things. Don't assume that others have exactly the same evil motives as you find in your own heart, hey. But rather, put the best possible interpretation on their actions. Look for those virtuous qualities in others that you know you are most in need of yourself. See, usually when we judge others on something, that's the thing we're actually judging ourselves on. That's the thing we're really struggling with. And when somebody does that, we're like, whoa, why do you eat so much? Then seek their help in acquiring those qualities. Teach me. Teach me. Everybody has something that we can learn from. Don't assume that your time, money, energy, thoughts, and opinions are more valuable than your neighbors. Everybody's time, money, and energy is just as important. When making a decision, consider not only how that decision will affect your own interests, but also how it will affect the interests of others. Be alert not only to your own needs, but also to the needs of others. Demonstrate your high estimation, valuing others more than yourself, of others by commending them for the qualities that they are biblically worthy of praise. Make that a habit and your life will be awesome. Everybody's awesome. You're looking for God qualities in them and go, wow, that's so awesome. And you know what? When you start giving such things to others, you receive it back too. That's a, such a much better community than what we're having right now. Guard your heart from developing a pattern, sorry, a pattern, not a pattern. Pattern means a uh, constant of critical, condemnatory, accusatory, judgmental thoughts about others. I can hear that's my brain all day when I don't ask God to tame it down. Pray for your brothers and sisters in Christ. Remind yourself often that God has given you everything you have to be proud of and that He has often used others to get you where you are. You didn't get there by yourself, honestly. God help you and use others to get you there. 
thank God and thank those whom He has used to bless you. Count your blessings. Don't say thank God, but who has He used? Thank God for them. Think about that. And、um, finally, I like to share with you a video. It's about four minutes. It's not from、uh, the SDA Church, but I think there are very good lessons there, and I like to give you a bit of time to watch it before I talk about it. It's so easy to place people in boxes, drawing lines, creating sides. There's us, and there's them. Those we feel comfortable around, and those we don't. There are those of us with many chapters, and those just starting their own stories. There's the well-to-do. And those doing what they can. There are those we share something with, and those we don't seem to share anything with. Welcome, and thank you for coming today, guys. Today, I'm going to be conducting an experiment、uh, where I'll ask you a series of questions. Now, these questions will be very personal questions, and for us to get a true result, I need you to be completely honest with how you respond. The first question I have is, who in here was the class clown? Who is never on time? There's us, we who have tattoos. We who feel lonely. We who have been bullied. Bullied others. We who are madly in love. We who have overcome great adversity. Whose team won the championship this year? We who beat cancer. Created in the image of God, and as one body, we stand together, united as one under His grace. So no matter which box you are in, you will be surprised to find that you have more in common, sometimes with somebody from another box, 
than the person next to you in the same box. If you remind yourself that you're human and we rehumanize our view of others, we will see that there are things that can, we can all help each other grow. And we're all in need of the same Savior. Amen. To receive the benediction. May the love of the Father, the grace of Jesus, the fellowship and transforming power of the Holy Spirit be with all of you, not just today, but till the next time we meet again on Sabbath. In Jesus' name, Amen.